TV, channel of God's love. A warm welcome to all our viewers on this episode of Activists of Goa. We are pleased to bring to you Goa's respected, most loved and adored High Court advocate and environment activist Padma Shri Norma Alvarez. Advocate Norma Alvarez is the well-known campaigner on social and environmental issues of public concern and has argued pro bono hundreds of public interest litigation cases in the Bombay High Court on environment issues, human rights, women and children's welfare, prevention of cruelty to animals, etc. for Goa's NGO and citizen groups. For all the selfless work she has done to the society in relation to the protection of environment, women's empowerment and animal welfare, she has received several accolades, including the prestigious Padma Shri from the Government of India in the year 2002 and the Yasha Damini Puraskar from the Government of Goa in the year 2003. We have pleasure in welcoming Advocate Norma Alvarez. Welcome to our studios, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So are we. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, your service towards society is so enormous. In fact, I don't know where to start and where to end, but I will make an attempt. <laughs> I do not know where I will end. I am very honored <laughs> at the accolades you are giving me before the interview even. Uh, Ma'am, can you tell us, uh, when did you actually develop the love for environment protection? Was it during your college days in, at the St. Xavier's in Mumbai? Well, I was a student of Sophia College, Mumbai, and uh, no, I did not really have environment concerns when I was in Mumbai, but I did develop a very strong social and political concern, you can say, <laughs> after a seminar uh, which I had attended somewhere in the year 1971 or 72 at the Vishwa Yuba Kendra which was taking an overall view of the situation in India and I realized that life was not as simple as a young teenager in college thinks. It is all about studying and improving oneself and getting a job and the world will become better for it. I realized then that there are millions who do not have access to these luxuries, I would say, of a college education. And uh, I began to think in terms of using the knowledge, the information, the skills that I had as a very good student, uh, how could I be of use to people in this country as well. That was somewhere when I was around 19 or 18, 19 or so okay. in college. Okay. But it did not get into environment, it was still a kind of social issue. You see things like the backward classes, Harijans, uh, you know, mm -hmm. un undeveloped societies and so on. My love for the environment came when I came to Goa. Okay. I began to see how important the environment is to people who are what you would I do not call them undeveloped or non-developed, but people who have less, less access to many things or the privileged society, let us say, the non-privileged society. For them, environment is their biggest asset. Clean water, fresh air, decent basic food, necessities. basic necessities, very important to an unprivileged sector of the people because that is their only asset. Privileged people can fly off to wherever they want when there is trouble. But for the rest of society, they are where they are and they have to put up with things that are around them. 
and environment thus became a big concern. As a matter of fact, uh, my husband and I, we lived in Chattari Taluka, okay. Thane village. Okay. For five years, we were on a farm. We had a rural development project as it was then called. And uh, I saw how people around there lived, how li what limited access they had to regular things like ration cards and uh, documents and so on. And uh, that was also the reason why I took to law. Okay. Yes, so, it is all you know, stemming from the, Goa. The surroundings around you ignited that, you know, yes. to do something for the less privileged people. Absolutely, and, absolutely. You know, give their life a meaning kind of, you know. Absolutely. So that, you know, whatever they cannot reach out on their own, there was someone giving them a hand. Well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make as though I was some kind of a savior. But, you know, it... Uh, being a, being in a in a privileged college, being a being coming from a society middle class but not poor people background, I could have climbed the ladder so to speak in university yes. or in civil service or in any any field that I wanted to. Liking, yes. But the inclination was how to do something with my education, my background, my skills. For some, for the less privileged, for people who are less privileged, basically it was that. How and environment, nice. environment became a strong uh, uh, pinhole, so to speak. So because then, gradually, from this wish of yours, uh, you moved into bigger public issues, and you fought for justice. Am I right? If that I is right. That, that is right. It so happened that around the time I finished law, I did yeah. law in while I was in, in, Goa. in Goa. Yes, while I was in <laughs> Goa. And around the time I finished law, which was in 1986, the Environment Protection Act was notified that year. Okay. An all-pervasive umbrella law, which brought everything regarding the environment into its domains, mm -hmm. which made it an overriding law. No other law can override the Environment Protection Act. It was like waiting for someone to get it enforced okay. and we began the enforcement of environment law actually so here in Goa. Can I say that the very act was the turning point for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. So uh, as far as I know you are the founding member of the Goa Foundation, Yes. a very prestigious NGO working in Goa yes. and this uh, NGO was founded somewhere in 1986. 86. Can 1986. you tell us uh, what is the USP of this Goa Foundation that it has, you know, gone to such level in social activism? See, Goa Foundation founding members are all Goans. Mm -hmm. They are what you would call upstanding members of Goan society. Mm -hmm. They were people who were uh, a journalist, there was uh, uh, landlords, there were people in industry. They all felt that we must do something for Goa in order to maintain its character, its uniqueness. And it was they were beginning to see that the, uh, the uh, industrial um, regime which was being foisted on Goa at that time, the Zuari agrochemicals, the Siba Geji, mm -hmm. these were all new industries, the uh, fertilizer companies and so on, yeah. pesticides these may cause Goa's destruction. And at that time again, the state was being opened up to tourism. There were five star yes. hotels coming up. Uh, sand dunes were being destroyed. The beginnings of development in a destructive form were being this. seen. And that is how we got together. Not any predominant uh, a requirement of legal. It, there was never, it was never in the mind that we will do legal work. It was we will do something to see that Goa is protected as it is because it's a beautiful uh, state. It's um, yeah, really uh, green. At that point of time, Goa was just you know running ahead a race to pick up and be with the rest of the country. Exactly. Something like exactly. that. Exactly. But the, the manner in which it was going was questionable. So at that time, it was kind of foresight, seeing that this is where it will lead. Yes. I will say that uh, Goan people at that time were looking at any any new industry as, you know, oh, wonderful, we'll get jobs here. Yes. Any new development, oh, this is good for us. But 
if you knew how things had developed in the rest of the country, seeing Goa trying to catch up with mm -hmm. development which was going down slide is something that a few people in Goa and It was saw. worrisome also. Yes. To people who knew the effects of the matter. If you knew that, but exactly. if you were very simplistic yes. and thought that yes. tourism, a uh, five-star hotel will bring you great <laughs> jobs and so on, then yes. you said, oh, why are you opposing it? We are getting some jobs and so on. Ma'am, as far as Goa Foundation is concerned, I think Goa Foundation takes the honor for starting the PIL culture in Goa for the citizens and for the activists. And uh, I think uh, the PIL, is the PIL the strongest way for a common man to seek legal N course? Not, not necessarily. Not, not necessarily, necessarily in the sense that going to the court is the last resort, resort. for any citizen. Okay. We do not advise people if you have a problem, go to court. We mm -hmm. do not advise it. We always say use whatever uh, methods are available in society, which is send a memorandum to your panchayat, to the town planning, to the chief minister, have a dharna if you need to, uh, send representations, do what you can to educate or to make persuade the government mm -hmm. to change its view. If all else fails, then we go to court. Okay. Uh, I know recently citizens say that, you know, uh, the, we have faith in the judiciary and we don't have faith in the government. But the fact remains that government is the administrative arm to, uh, to uh, make policies Correct. and so on. And the judiciary is only to see whether those policies that are made and those decisions that are taken in are in violation of law or not. The judiciary does not make law. Correct. So therefore, I would say that the way to for citizens to raise their protest is to participate in public administration. Now you you find sometimes a notification issued asking for comments. How many citizens respond to it? Respond to it. Show that you are opposed to it. Give your reasons. Think about it. Mm -hmm. All these are ways before you go to court, to which court. is the last. Resort. So the PIL, according to you, is the last resort. For absolutely, citizen. I am but absolutely. You have to clear. exhaust all the other measures that you have. You do democratically. Have. Yes. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. You have to e exhaust them democratically. As you said, then I would also uh, the things uh, support that view that today people have huge faith in the judiciary. Judiciary is their last source, you know, of getting the right justice. Yes. And that is why perhaps they bypass all these in between routes and go directly for a PIL. Is it something that like is, that? That uh, is, people uh, ask. Things are changing very fast as far as Goa is concerned. What happens is when the executive moves too fast, then if you don't get a judicial order halting it, yeah. you also become late in a public interest matter because you cannot go to court when the project is three quarters done and uh, yes, you, by the time you approach the court, the court weighs it. They look at how much money is invested, yeah. when did you come to know and so on. So time is also of the essence. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the government keeps hiding a lot of information. And by the time citizens get to know of it, there is already um, half, half the trees are felled and the project is already halfway through. Uh, properties are sold. They are sold on the internet and so on. And then the third party rights come in and a whole, the whole ball game is different. different. So that is why people start trying to go to the court as soon as they Do can. Do not waste time. Do not waste time. Ma'am, I want to take you down memory lane. It was somewhere in the mid-80s, if I can recall, somewhere in 1987. Goa Foundation made everyone to stand up and take notice when you filed the PIL against illegal sand mining and destructions of sand dunes in Goa. It was quite rampant then. Uh, can you tell us if, was this the first PIL on record as far as Goa is concerned? Because till such time, I think people were not much into uh, taking recourse to judiciary through the PIL. I, actually, in those days, it was not even called public interest litigation. What it was, was it? it was simply writ petition. Writ petition. It okay. was simply called a writ petition. So I cannot say that it is the first writ petition. Okay. But it was As a, a PIL, writ petition. Yeah. Yes, it was a writ petition wherein we said that we are coming to file this writ petition in public interest mm. and we are not personally affected 
and the 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 uh, uh, the the destruction of sand dunes is happening all across the coast we are an environment organization we kind of made out a case for our intervention because one of the main things that you have to do in a litigation is to disclose locus standi which means what is your standing in this matter mm -hmm. what interest do you have and usually people have some personal interest you know some building in front of my house or some uh, road which is blocking my not giving me access whatever so we had to disclose that we don't have any interest in it but we see that there is this destruction and it is going to destroy goa because goa is filled with sand dunes and so on and uh, in that sense you can say it was the first public interest litigation okay. but it was not called pil right and um, um uh, the then advocate ferdin rebello mm -hmm. who later became uh, chief justice of yes. allahabad high court yes. uh, goan he is the one who argued that case okay. i didn't argue the case i was just about just i just got legal my career, <laughs> yes, I, i just entering the legal uh, profession But talking but he about argued it. talking about your legal profession and career ma'am can you recall right from the time of your legal profession till now how many uh, PILs have you fought on a pro bono basis for I, I, NGOs and citizen groups? I think I am told they have crossed a huge number. <laughs> yeah, they, are, they have they have crossed two hundred and fifty. Maybe they are nearing three hundred. Almost three hundred. Am I right? Much. Yes, yes. So how do you feel about it? You know, giving so much of time for society, fighting for a cause. At the end of the day, how do you feel? You know, there is a, there is a tremendous amount of satisfaction. Um, not at winning mm -hmm. i mean surely there is a lot of happiness at winning but there is a lot of satisfaction when when you are able to represent the wishes of the client the anguish of the client the the this you know they they distress and distraught at what is happening if you are able to represent that to the court and you find that the court understands what you are saying you get a it great amount you. it gives me great satisfaction when i come out of the court and uh, the you know the ngos or the citizen groups that i represent they say madam bore gele ha amche sagle sangle sarke so <laughs> that is a sense of satisfaction yes, at the end but, of the day uh, yeah. but um, uh, well i've always been happy to uh, represent these issues Uh, mm. because uh, you know in my earlier before i became uh, a lawyer i used to be a lecturer in bombay okay. in uh, sophia college i taught so so speaking and uh, addressing uh, uh, you know an audience of then students maybe now judges and trying to put things logically to explain to someone is uh, something which is already there in me okay. it's a question of only uh, putting the law across rather than putting a subject across but okay, teaching somebody fine. and you know going to From the, the courts, context of the law in some <laughs> sense is the same i don't have stage fright i don't have uh, inability to express those are those are i think gifts which god has given me and uh, if i can use them well why not but i have always felt a great sense of satisfaction double satisfaction when you win no yes, doubt of course but uh, uh, well at least if you've done your best that gives you some some hope and pleasure Ma'am, some years back, I think was it 1998 before 2000, uh, you made headlines in Goa when you fought a case very convincingly, convinced the court and won a court order uh, to stop the killing of stray dogs yeah. in Goa. Yeah. Now, what was the situation like then that prompted you to approach the court to bring this order? See in in 1990s 97 98 98 98 yes 98 it was the stray dogs before that 97 was the bull fights but uh, in 96 there were a group of people who had who were feeling very distressed at the fact that there were all these wounded and badly mange mm -hmm. dogs roaming Moving around everywhere yeah they were the around the yes. place and there was there would be a dog with so many puppies running around somebody would kick it somebody would throw it. Mm -hmm. so uh, they uh, they approached uh, uh, they actually they approached mrs menaka gandhi she said go and ask norma alvarez okay uh, to help you to form an organization 
So we formed an organization called People for Animals. It was formed in okay. 1996. So pe People for Animals came first. Yes. Before you fought the case. Yes. Yes. Okay. The case is fought on behalf of People for Animals. Mm -hmm. They are the petitioner. People for Animals, the petitioner. So we formed this organization to try and do something basically for stray dogs. And when we formed the organization, we recognized that one of the methods of dealing with stray dogs was to shoot them. And there were there was another uh, 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 two two uh, girls from an organization called International Animal Rescue. They had on their own been doing a sterilization of dogs in the coastal area. Okay. That year in October, they came to me crying that night, saying, "You know, we we did a lot of sterilizations, and then there is an order from the tourism department to clear up the beach areas." And when we dug up the places where they buried the dogs, we found that they were all the sterilized dogs, the friendly dogs. So we approached the court saying okay. that this is the methodology and it's coming from the colonial regime, okay. where in the colonial time, apparently, there were dog shooters. They would yes. shoot the dogs. They would chop their tails off. They would present them to the municipal council and they would get 25 okay. paisa per tail. Yes. So okay. very barbaric and horrible. Yes. Second thing is we also realized, and there were dog shooters at that time, that any colony would call the dog shooter and he would simply go and spray all, you know, gun, uh, bullets all Just over. randomly. So, small pet dogs would come running out there to see what's happening, yes. get they shot. Also get they would shot. also get shot. That's how we came to the court to say that this is barbaric practice. You can, you control the dogs, the dog population, find a way. But not by simply shooting them. It is bad for children. Children are going to school. They see a dog shooter. He's shooting somebody. All this kind of thing. That is why we approached the court. But I think after you got that order banning the shooting of stray dogs, there was a lot of opposition in Goa. Yes. From a certain uh, section of the society. Not all. There were many others who appreciated this move. You are, you are right. People, people recognize... Even till now, people recognize that it is not a good thing to simply shoot the dogs or to poison the dogs and so on. The problem is that people say, what is to be done with the dogs? Because the dogs on the streets do cause problems for citizens. They chase them sometimes. You have examples of young children have been mauled. Yes. Somebody has been bitten. All these things are, are there. And the only way to control this is to conduct a sterilization program to neuter the dogs, <laughs> to see that there is no more population of dogs and thereby to reduce the numbers so that the, num the dogs which are there, at least we can find homes for them and get them adopted, get people to look after them. There is no other great solution that one can find. But I think over the years, uh there's a lot of change in the mindset of people, you know. Yes. There are, I, I know of many uh, people in Goa, on their own, they are doing this little bit of, you know, a kind yes. of voluntary service. Yes. They will pick up a dog, put out on the social media and get a nice home for the dog. It's Absolutely. a great service, actually. Absolutely. You need not be part of any institution or an NGO. This is a small service towards society and kindness to the Animal. A Am lot right? of uh, a lot of citizens. I I always feel that when citizens call and say there is a, a problem here, there is a problem there, it is not to be taken as oh they are calling us and troubling us. It is to be taken as a recognition that people are recognizing that there is a cruelty being happening to an animal and can someone rescue it? In fact, they call us. They say, can you take puppies? Well, we cannot keep on taking uh, you know puppies like that. But take the case even of snakes. 20, uh, 30 years ago, if people saw a snake, they would First pick up the stick. Kill it. <laughs> now, then the slogan yes. came, instead of picking up a stick, pick up a telephone and call a snake rescuer. <laughs> so, that brought about a change, a change, social change. And now there are at least 20, yes. 25 snake rescuers absolutely, trained absolutely. to rescue. And, uh, not only the snake rescuers, official guys from the Department of Forest, I think there. But there are people who are themselves learning this art it of getting is, It snakes. is the ordinary snakes. citizens. I am talking yes. about the citizens. Forest department sometimes comes, sometimes they are, uh, you know, um, off duty. Hours. But yeah. citizens in every yes. place every are, place they, have a they are ready to go at any hour of the day or night. Getting back to PFA, you said it was the PFA who approached the court and brought yes. about this order. 
Now, uh, you uh, you have been running the centers. How many centers across Goa do you have of PFA? And uh, what uh, what exactly is PFA doing, uh, you know, to control the stray menace and spread of rabies? Okay. I think it's a national program. There is a national there program. There is a national program. Yeah. So, to answer your first question, PFA has got two centers. One mm -hmm. in Vasco, okay. one in Ponda. But okay. there are many animal welfare organizations spread over Goa. There is Paws in Panjim. There is Goa Animal Welfare Society in South Goa. The South Goa Animal Welfare Trust. There are many in different places. Almost all of them are doing, first and foremost, a sterilization program for stray dogs, which means that the, the, they have a tie-up with the local municipality hmm. and the system is that the uh, state government funds the municipality in order to fund the NGO. That is how it works. So money is paid to the municipality who pays a certain rate to the NGO for sterilizing dogs. That's one program that is done. The second thing that PFA does is relief and rescue. Phone call, like, like in, the, in Vasco, any time uh, we are a, a part of the, we are, uh, are, we are sheltered in the Marmagao uh, Municipal Council's land. So yes. we are an MMC animal yes. shelter. Yes. So we take all calls which are road accidents, whether they are cattle or whether they are dog, we, pay, we take them up, we pick them up, we take them to the shelter. It's not a very large shelter. So cattle, if we pick up, we send it to Dhyan Foundation, which has a large uh, shelter, shelter in South for Goa for okay. cattle. Dogs we rescue, we keep in the shelter, we treat them, treat them, we then return them, we sterilize them and so on. So basically it is a sterilization program and a, re a, re a rescue and relief program that we conduct. We, do, uh, we also do um, these vaccination camps yes. uh, we, uh, in, in the city but there is this mission rabies also which is funded by government and they do an all Goa uh, vaccination camp. In fact, I am a witness to your PFA uh, functioning in Vasco ah. and they are doing a marvelous job, I should say. Mm. You just got to give them a call and they are at Somebody the site to rescue yes, the dog. Yes, yes, yes. Second thing, even their uh, mission control, rabies control mission is really doing well. Very, and well good. Very successful very good. attempt. Yes, yes. And secondly, another thing that I have seen is after they rescue a dog, they keep it in their shelter, treat it of uh, any sickness it has exactly. got. Exactly. And there are people who come and take it for adoption. Yes. That's the biggest, you know, yes. chain that this PFA has brought in Vasco region, in the Murmagaon. That is why we only need to control new numbers. And one yes. of the problems is these pedigree dogs. You know, people get these, uh, these breeds like the Rottweilers mm -hmm. and uh, these are breeds which if they, if they mix with the locals, the pups that come out have got these uh, sort of violent qualities Ferocious. also in them, ferociousness Ferocious in them. Kind of Whereas our local Goan dogs, they are very tame. Docile. They are docile. docile. It's a shoe, they run away. Exactly. These people don't. They, mm -hmm. So that becomes a problem in society. They retaliate. They retaliate. Right from small ones. Because, because they, they have got it in their blood. <laughs> <laughs> Bloodline is like that. Um, uh, a short while ago, you spoke about, you know, People, some citizens were mauled. We had a case like this in Vasco. Yes. In the month of April, I think, where a, a middle-aged woman was woman. badly mauled by the yes. strays. You know. Now this stray may have been neutered, may have been even injected against rabies. But then, how do we get control of this situation like that? Because I no doubt, PFA picks the dog, will treat it, neuter it also, and all the other things that they do. But then they are leaving it back in the surrounding uh, from where they have picked it up. But you know, see, the, the issue of people what always... What would be the reason for a dog to go and attack a human being just like in that? In that case, that, 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 uh, that dog who attacked that woman, mm -hmm. she said she was walking and she stumbled on something and she fell and the dog attacked her, something, something. Mm -hmm. now, that was a female dog. She had four or five, five little pups. In that forest, there was a jungle somewhere yes, there. Yeah, she had sure. pups there. And she was trying to look for food which she could take back for them. Okay. So the woman, uh, to be honest, she was very, she was quite sympathetic. We visited in the hospital and she said, Jana, Oshe, Zata, Kenna, Kenna. And so on. I had okay. food in my hand and maybe the dogs wanted mm -hmm. that. These are really unfortunate incidents. I cannot give you an explanation, but basically that's why we are trying to control the population. Eventually, we had to spend a lot of time trying to catch that dog. She was a, though she, uh, she was a female, but she was the leader of the pack. If she barked, 
five males would come would to help her. Come, yeah, <laughs> so, so that is how there was a pack of dogs. But uh, we have sort of successfully neutered them. Sometimes what we do is we pick up the the, the alpha male, whoever is the leader, I see. and we take it of away. The pack, yeah. Yes, keep it away for some time. Try to break the pack in that sense, its leadership. And then when you return it, he has lost its standing, and the thing okay. becomes a little bit um, easier, so to speak. So, so if government had some kind of a, uh, you know this uh, shelter. Uh, where uh, you know from time to time you could keep a dog and then release it which we do in our shelters it mm -hmm. might have helped but the then uh, there are your own limitations the shelter is not yes. that big to house so many it's dogs it's not big government has to step in somewhere no and, and you provide know, because there are ngos who will do the work but they need this backup system support. you need you need regular money and there's also the fact that if you suppose you took away all the dogs then all the food which lies around, you will have the multiplication of rats will be there. That is, that uh, is also, that is was found in Surat. Uh, yes. When they had that whole plague over there about 15, 20 years ago, yes. uh, they cleaned up this, uh, the city and uh, then there was not, no one to scatter the food. Yeah. And I mean, it is looks disgusting, yeah, but yeah. at least when the sun comes, it dries it up. If it stays in that, uh, uh, you know, how people take yes, their bags yes, and throw exactly. it. Exactly. So again, it is garbage. If it's not done, uh, not uh, taken care of properly, leads to the stray dog population. Mm. It's but a then kind of vicious yeah, it's cycle. Cyclical, yeah. Uh, you have uh, to deal with it. Moving from the dogs, yeah. I want to bring your attention to the bullfights. Yeah. PFA had also filed a PIL some yes, years back. Yes. They fought the case and uh, they brought about a ban on organized bullfights in yes. Goa. Now there was a. You know, the opinion was divided while some people liked it because uh, the reason was that there's some cruelty against uh, animals and you wanted to prevent that cruelty. Yeah. But then there are politicians in the south especially who are in favor of continuing these organized bullfights. Mm. They even quoting the Supreme Court ruling on the other states. Jalikatu. Jalikatu, right? And they want to apply it to our state. Yeah. What is your take on this very sensitive issue as far as Goa is concerned? See, if you, if you take the case of stray dogs, mm -hmm. by having a ban on killing stray dogs, people have some problem because the stray dogs are attacking them or there is any, some problem with them. Bull fights is a pure entertainment. Nothing happens if bull fights are not organized. Only some people entertainment is taken away what they consider the entertainment and there is a whole gambling and betting which goes away that is what is the reason why politicians want to continue with bullfights it's a kind of pastime for people and there is a whole there's an organized betting ring with people on the ship and people abroad and here and there okay. all uh, uh, supporting the institution of bullfights now, bullfights is per se, mm. according to the law, no way that you cannot read it unless the law changes. If you incite one animal to fight another animal, it is a violation of the act. As okay. simple as that. As simple. You incite, that means you organize yes. one animal to fight the other animal, whether it is a bull, whether it is two rabbits, whether it is two dogs, mm -hmm. whether it is two goats. If you organize the fight, it is a violation of law. Okay. So it's an open and shut case. There was nothing that the court uh, could do to say that, oh no, you are looking after the bull very nicely, which was their argument. We take care of the bulls, we feed them with uh, almonds and uh, jaggery <laughs> and God knows what. Okay, you do all that. But per se, you are violating that. That is why Jalikatu is not a straightforward violation of the law. There, the people are supposed to overpower the bulls in some way. They, they let the bulls run okay. and people jump on the on animal the and try. Yeah, yeah. It is not a fight of one animal against another animal. Like instigating. So there is no way Jalika to okay. whatever the Supreme Court has uh, allowed or permitted, that cannot be applicable to bullfights in Goa, mm -hmm. which is a straightforward fight against uh, two an uh, of one animal against the other. So I, I would say that, see, in the case of stray dogs, you can have a citizen saying that, you know, how is this banned because this dog has bitten my child and so on. What is your, the, the reason for bullfights? You only want to entertain yourself by having two, fight, two bulls fight against each other. Why should you have the animals uh, 
fight they do not want to fight they do not want to fight they fight for a reason they fight if they want to uh, dominate the other male yeah. they fight if their food is the issue they fight for a reason they do not fight just for fun that is that is a plain and simple thing. <laughs> So, uh, you are happy that uh, whatever you set out to do, banning this thing, it has been achieved. It is the so law. That there is no cruelty for the an, uh, for animals. It is the law. There are violations. I am aware that there are violations. I am aware that sometimes they are organized. I mean, when, when they are organized. If I get a complaint and I know that they are organized in South Korea, I call the police and I tell them, you go to the, the, the I am told that there is a ban, mm -hmm. uh, that there is a bullfight to be organized. organized. I went to the court in contempt petitions quite, the, the uh, police have drawn up a, a regime saying that these are the officers whom you should call in case a bullfight is organized. Do they reach on time? They do not reach on time <laughs> because I think they are also halfway partial to the, to, the, uh, to the holding of the fights. They go and they say that it was already over or whatever it is. But you know, I look at it this way. There is a law which says that you cannot murder somebody else. The murders take place. What am I to do about it? So, there is a law which says you cannot have bullfights. You are violating the law. If we manage to catch somebody, whatever penalties are there, which takes me to the fact that the penalties under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act are so ridiculous that nobody is afraid of them. They are the act, the, it is coming up in parliament mm -hmm. for uh, amendment. Okay. When they bring in those penalties of 1 lakh and 50,000, then people will sit up and take notice. Right now, they are 100 rupees. So, even if you catch somebody, the police feel very disheartened. They say, we catch a person for violation of it. He says, make the chalan, I will pay the fine. So, it is very discouraging, discouraging. Uh, and 50 rupees and 100 rupees in today's world is Just no, nothing. Peanuts. <laughs> peanuts, nothing, nothing. So, that's uh, You are also the member of the Animal Welfare Board of India. Yeah. And uh, as a member of the board, uh, have you taken any steps, any action on this stray cattle menace on our roads? It has come to such a point that it is the biggest risk for any rider or uh, a person driving a car, especially in this monsoons. Otherwise also, many uh, people have met with accidents. At one time, at one time, our organization PFA tried to paint the horns of those cattle fluorescent, fluorescent paints. paints in Vasco area. Mm -hmm. We tried to do it. At another time, we also tried in the evening hours to shoo the cattle off the highways because that is the place where they go at a very high speed. But um, the high court had directed every municipality and panchayat panchayats, yes. to have a cattle pound. The municipalities and panchayats all gave a list of places where they have a cattle pound and they have a cattle pound keeper also. Mm -hmm. But that fellow is now doing other clerical work and there is a uh, survey number given and there is not a bucket nor a rope nor an anything in that place. Now, government has come up with having uh, funding the Dhyan Foundation in the south and uh, uh, another organization Gomantak uh, in, the, in the north and has told them to take the cattle. It is may, it is given uh, this uh, vehicles with hydraulic lift and so on to pick up cattle and so on. But I do feel that we have not managed to deal with the problem as yet. I will honestly say that it's I all on the paper that it's cattle on the pound paper. should be there. It the panchayat should take the responsibility. Municipality should take yes. responsibility in municipal areas. But it's not happening. It's not happening, and the court is still grappling Somebody in a public interest litigation. Somebody is dragging their feet on this. See, the cattle also are too many. That is also there. There are there are too many cattle. Uh, people find that uh, once once the cattle is not productive, that it means it is not giving milk, then those who have cattle, they just they let them go. They do not care about them. So, they leave them. Then the cattle have discovered that in the market places, there is some nice good vegetables and so, so on. They are so, they tend them. to go. In fact, in the, in the Mapsa market, the cattle 
they all come to the place in the evening time and they eat over there and then they go home in the morning time they have got they have even understood the the, the, the regime <laughs> so that's how they sit on the roads because the roads in the night are little warmer than the sides mm -hmm. so they tend to remain there but it is a problem and um, i i think unless you have large uh, gaushalas mm -hmm. where you can uh, take the cattle them and, and just keep dump them, them there. And government can feed them because unlike dogs, cattle can stay together. It's not a problem if you have a big goshala and you have mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you can arrange for food, the vegetable waste in the market to be taken. But short of taking them to some place, there is not much else that you can do with the sort of regime. It is a problem. Ma'am, as you look back on the last forty years of your legal career and this high profile and at stressful job of a you know. Uh, social activists, environment activists, and fighting PILs to protect Goa and Goa's destructions. Have you any time regretted your decision to be in this hot seat? <laughs> Not really. I will tell you that I we live in Para, in a village. It's a very quiet village, and I am um, surrounded. Uh, in fact, we don't even have a a, a a road of a traffic road in front of us. We have a small narrow lane. lane. And when I go home, and we are uh, at home, we only hear the crickets at night and the birds early morning. I <laughs> cannot hear a single horn or anything. I think that being in a peaceful area rejuvenates the spirit you for the day. next day <laughs> it does you have a, a sense of peace i forget about the chief minister of goa and the, the prime minister of india and all the policies and yeah. i'm involved with the dog and the cats and you know whatever is there no doubt some time is spent in preparing for the next day and so on but it's not as if uh, it, it, it's a quiet of the place and the peaceful environment which invigorates you and you can get up next morning with a new will. I think that if I was living in the city with noise and some things and all, I yeah. might not have been, I might have felt the pressures right. of, uh, you know, civilization on your head. But this is as peaceful as it can get. It's a natural therapy. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> natural therapy. Do you agree with me? <laughs> absolutely. And no, I don't regret it at all. I, I do, re uh, in one sense, you know, in my uh, younger days, I used to be a good singer, okay. but uh, arguing my head off in the courts, I have lost that singing voice. You have voice. forgotten to sing. Not <laughs> forgotten. I have lost that voice. Okay. You know, you you strain yeah. your vocal cords yes. a bit much. So it becomes and, uh, So if I got if I got any regret, that is one regret <laughs> that I should have learned to talk softer in the beginning. In those days, we never used to have mics in the court. Right. And being a lady advocate, with a lot. All others were men advocates and they have louder and stronger voices. So I had to use my power yeah, of the vocal cords. and I strained my voice yeah. as a result. So today I cannot sing like I used to sing. So that is the only regret I have, <laughs> if at all. Uh, Ma'am, once again I want to ask you, you yeah. know, even uh, for the last 40 years of your yeah. legal profession, yeah. your social activism, which is more in focus, you know, as a social activist, environment activist, have you any time felt threatened or intimidated by the powers that be, by the multinational against whom you fight sometime, the industrialists? Has it been any time like this? Not really, not really. Including the projects that you always, you know, have a word to say. Sometimes we have, sometimes we have had, uh, maybe the project proponent or maybe a friend of the project proponent who is known to us, mm -hmm. who might have called up to say that, you know, there is this project that you are fighting against. Can we come and see you about it? But we have always taken the view that once the project is in the court, then there is no point in us, uh, there is no negotiation possible. We have gone in a public interest litigation. Yes. We cannot withdraw a public interest litigation. And whatever we have to say, we can only say it uh, through the through the courts. And uh, I think people, I mean, in the beginning years, they used to say that, uh, uh, you know, that time we were doing the coastal hotels. 
And in the early years, I remember they used to say that, uh, oh, you are fighting against uh, this hotel at the behest of that hotel or that <laughs> hotel at the behest of that. But I think over Those the years, mere allegations. they used to, it used to be an allegation that, you know, somebody has put them up to it and so on. But it has never been proved because it is simply not true. And um, we fought against the entire lot of hotels on, on whatever grounds there were or industry or whatever. But I remember when I, uh, when I uh, took the bullfight case to court, I had to enter the court and on both sides of the court, there were the, all the strong men of the bullfights who were standing. Organizers. <laughs> so I was for two minutes intimidated and I held my files close to my chest and put my head down and walk straight through. <laughs> That's so that the only, was the only time. moment. That remember. is the only time I can say I was a little worried about, you know, uh, so many guys who were around. But not really. We've not had any threats. Uh, Ma'am, your NGO or Goa Foundation, yeah. you know, commands a lot of respect, not only in Goa, but beyond the borders too. It has got a different image altogether. It commands respect among the citizens, the judiciary, even the government. But at the end of this, how do you feel about it now? That you started something like that, not knowing where it would take you, and today you are at a very commanding position in the eyes of the citizen. I don't know how to answer that question. In the sense of, well, we just feel that we, we, we did something that we enjoyed doing. To be honest, it has not been a cross that we had to carry. It has not been that somebody forced us to do something and uh, we have had success out of it. You didn't it, see it as a burden on you. We never saw it. We, we enjoyed it. Time. We have enjoyed it. I can, uh, I can tell you in the, in the mm -hmm. sense of we have not enjoyed the, the problems, but we have, uh, we have been uh, happy to, f to, to uh, use our minds, which, uh, well, both my husband and I, both Claude and I have, to use the mind to negotiate uh, the, the, the law and see, uh, well, this is happening. Is there a law which prevents it? In what way is it working? It's a kind of mental exercise that you do to see whether the thing is right or whether it is wrong. And uh, uh, then, then, the, then the preparation, how to prepare a PIL, yes. how to place it before the court, what is the best points to put before? Because early in my career, I, you, I was uh, in a sense mentored by advocate, senior advocate Indira Jai Singh who is a very famous uh, uh, lawyer and she always told me that you rem remember put your best points first. So what is the best angle to take in a PIL uh, because there are many facets to it you know you could uh, go on one side or another side what you could uh, discuss. So how to present it and then there is the satisfaction of uh, succeeding, succeeding in getting some relief and so on. Day. So it's never been a burden and it's uh, nobody has made us do what we did. What now, we coming back to Goa, Goa yeah. is such a small state mm. among all the other states in our country and we have just about 40 constituencies and say, uh, uh, I mean the uh, land mass of around 3,700 kilometers, square kilometers and population less than 16 lakhs. Yeah. Do we need so many social activists to protect our small state? Or is it forced upon us to come out as social activists? I think it's one of the strong points of Goa that there are so many people who are rising up. And vigilant. Vigilant and wanting to protect the state. Not many states have this. People here are vigilant. They are aware. They are willing to put aside their personal lives and come out to fight for the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, Goa means that much to people. It, they could easily say, oh, what do I care? You know, I, I will go and live abroad. I'll take my money and go. But Goa is so evocative that people who live here and peop Goans who live abroad also, they all want to see what is happening with their beloved Goa. Goa. And that is how the number of activists have is on, uh, the, rise. Is on the rise. I remember Justice Sri Krishna saying to me once when I was arguing on uh, some matter, he said, how is that you, you should come to Bombay, we, we need people like you in, in our city also, something like to that effect, you know, um, that uh, it's, it's a matter of pride, I think, that there are so many vigilant people and coming out. Please don't go, ma'am, we need you in Goa. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I'm not going anywhere. Our time is running out, but I have few more. Okay. Just two, three more questions, yeah. and I need brief answers from you. Are you happy with the recent High Court order to the Goa government that that uh, ma ma uh, that Madhi Wildlife Sanctuary has to be notified? You know, within a, a period of three months. I am overjoyed. You overjoyed. I'm overjoyed. Um, the reason being that not only will the forests be protected because the National Tiger Conservation Authority in its report said there is no management plan for Goa's wildlife. That is what the NTC has said. Such a strong indictment of the Goa government. It's a very serious observation. Very serious. No management plan. Said also that the although the wildlife area is there, 700 odd square kilometers, the kind of animal population that should be there is not there. You don't have the levels of, of animals, the deer, the, the, the sambar, the small, uh, the rabbits. That, there, is a, there is a chain of kind of animals which have to exist for the tiger to survive. And if the tiger survives, it means all this is there. So that, that is why the tiger is the umbrella species, okay. the apex species. For all the other species. It means Down that there are co-predators, yes. they have got food to eat, they have got food to eat, they have got food to eat. That kind of chain is there which helps in the pollination, biodiversity, mm -hmm. all this is there. So, when you have such a strong indictment of by the NTCA of Goa's wildlife which says that you have marked the area but the, but the, 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 the protection and the management is not there at all then it is high time that it is put up at the earliest. And the area has been marked. They don't have to search for the area. Right. They only have to make the notify the area. Secondly, they have to apply for the funds. They will get the funds. Along with the funds, they can put in all the infrastructure which is required. So I am extremely happy at the uh, court's order. But what we hear now following the court order, the, the forest minister is quite adamant on you know implementing the court orders and he's looking for options and you know alternatives how to uh, cross this uh, high court order and even approach the supreme court if if need be and maybe some other options too that is what we get the feel as a citizen but uh, what is your opinion will this hold if he goes into an appeal see it it is the right because you have fought the case so meticulously with all facts and figures the High Court Order 94-page judgment is very, very detailed. It has covered all the angles because all the angles were raised by them. They raised all these issues and all their objections, I dealt with each objection that they have raised. Now they are coming out with 15,000 people and so on. But they Yes, but they never put that before the High Court. Mm -hmm. They never said to the High Court that we don't want a wildlife uh, a tiger reserve. They never told the court that 15,000 people will be affected or whatever numbers they are giving because they would have to show how 15,000 people are, are affected, ha have to be resettled. Exactly. Today they are just giving figures but the, uh, the forest officers who drew up the tiger reserve, they specifically stated we have drawn the boundaries of the tiger reserve excluding the habitable areas. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the forest department says that in writing yes. and that document is put before the court, why did you not counter it and say, no, that, that document is wrong. I didn't produce it. Your own department, department produced, it. produced it. You could have produced figures showing whatever you wanted to show. So right of appeal is your right. I will say you want to appeal the order. You have a right to appeal. But I think that all the legal arguments are covered in the high court order. And moreover, it is not... The Goa, the Goa Foundation who is saying that it is, should be made a tiger reserve. It is the National Tiger Conservation Authority saying it should be made a, a tiger reserve. I have only come and presented it to the court. That's all I have said. I have said they are saying make it a tiger reserve. So attacking the Goa Foundation and saying that you have asked for a tiger reserve is not the issue at all. We, it's like I am the messenger. You don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> You go to the to the NTCA, NTC who has who has, uh, has given it 
and that after all remember project tiger is a national project it's a prestigious Absolutely. it's a prestigious project absent the, the prime minister is championing it yes. why should goa state and say we don't want to be so part of it so many other states in the 55, country which have 55 set up tiger, tiger reserves tiger reserves why tigers. does goa uh, uh, state not and want to be part over, of it uh, not only tiger is a national animal it's a endangered species Absolutely. and we all know that the presence of tigers in our wildlife sanctuary is a fact they are no longer visitors or tourists as the narrative goes you know from certain quarters it, am i right it's a fact yeah. and they mo- so tigers have to move up and down what is this big fuss about notifying it into a tiger corridor i don't know what is the fuss because it's not it's not going beyond the wildlife sanctuary the it's already a wildlife within, sanctuary yes. area it's within the area it's already a wildlife sanctuary i showed to the court that in the fringe areas or the buffer zone mm-hmm. people do not have to be resettled they want people there because they want to encourage the a uh, soft tourism in those areas as well so people will benefit but uh, if you mislead people and tell say that 15000 people have to be moved ma'am so uh, one last question yeah on this whole thing uh, especially the tiger reserve yeah. and the tiger corridor uh, are the people in power not mandated to protect the fragile ecosystem of the land and the wildlife so that the wildlife and human beings can live in perfect harmony they absolutely can't we do it they absolutely are required and i think that is the message of the high court's uh, judgment not just for protection of tigers but the high court was saying that when we make laws we favor human beings but in the real world we are just part of the whole yes. system animals and us are one in the real in the world in the universe yeah in the real world if there is no forest we will also suffer whatever our laws may be so while our laws may say one thing and we may after all we draw laws in favor of ourselves and we don't necessarily draw in favor of others but in the real world we are all part of the one earth and therefore we need to protect the forest so that the forest can enable us to survive that is the message of the uh, of the judgment apart from saying protect the tiger because it's the apex species so that is that is that is the message and uh, sure it is the mandate of the government to protect and when they say when the government says we are doing everything to protect the uh, the, the 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 animal, wildlife, wildlife and so on i i read out to the court what the national tiger conservation authority said that there is no plan you have marked the area which was uh, the whole uh, wildlife sanctuaries from north to south but you don't have a plan you have no watch towers you have no wireless you have no anti poaching squads you have nothing of the sort and that is why there is a kill of the of the animals uh, ma'am thank you very much for the time that you have spent you are welcome you are welcome at our studios thank you you have taken me back uh, to my yes. head 40 years ago <laughs> but it was a pleasure yeah. to talk with you and answer all your questions same here ma'am thank you very much so that was padma sri advocate norma alvarez for the last 40 years she has been working tirelessly for the protection of our environment and protection of goa and goan interests god bless and look at norma alvarez keep watching your favorite channel the ccr tv channel thank you